Good morning and happy Easter from Westminster Presbyterian Church in Minneapolis. My name is Matt Skinner. I'm the Scholar for Adult Education at Westminster, and I am pleased for this morning's Adult Education Hour to be joined by the Reverend Dr. Sarah Henrik for the second of a series of two presentations on drawing closer to the stories of Passion Week and Easter through not just the biblical text, but also through visual arts as well. If you missed us last week, or if you don't know, Sarah, she is Professor of New Testament Emerita at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, where she and I taught together for uh, many years, joyfully. She also is a former interim associate pastor at Westminster Presbyterian and continues to do various kinds of interim ministries for Lutheran churches, maybe even other churches in the Twin Cities area, and is a docent at MIA at the Minneapolis Institute of Art as well. So knows a lot about not just biblical texts, but how they've been represented, how the story gets told and retold, and the power of art to draw us deeper into the mysteries we have been observing this whole week. Sarah, thank you so much for coming back for, for round two. You are so welcome and delighted to be here to explore this particular mystery, uh, <laughs> which is very difficult to imagine. And so this is a great chance to do that with some artists. Indeed. Uh, this week we are going to be a little bit shorter than, than our usual weeks because of the, the long prelude for the Easter service. So we probably should jump right in. What should we be looking for in general with the images that you've selected for us today? Well, I'm really excited to do this, but I know we're going to have to go faster than I want to. And Here's just a little guide. You can also check the slide list and look at these on your own. But I kind of divided these into three groups. I don't know if it was accidental on purpose, but there they are. The first group of four slides are depicting uh, the resurrection from a very classical point of view at the Renaissance right through a very contemporary uh, you might have other words for it, point of view. The second group we're going to go to is looking at depictions of the witnesses of the resurrection. How do we know anything about this resurrection? And each of the gospel writers tells us about people who somehow saw Jesus or the empty tomb, depending on the gospel writer. And thirdly, we're going to come to the kind of witness that more contemporary painters leave with us to the resurrection and what it means. I'm going to ask you to keep your eye wide open in that first section for the people around the Christ. Uh, look at his torso and then look at the connection to nature. And you'll see this change. It's really interesting. I, I can't remember, maybe seven years ago or I don't know, give or take. Uh, Tim Hart Anderson did a wonderful Easter sermon where he challenged his hearers to remember that the resurrection is about more than human salvation, but extends to nature itself. And uh, it was a great sermon. I want you to see some of the historical roots in art for that. So let's go with Piero della Francesca to start. And this is just a classic classic depiction of the resurrection and just stare at it as much as you can. I'll keep going and point out some things that I think are really important, easy to miss if you're not accustomed to looking at this. Here is Jesus with a monumental quality, right? This comes from late, late in the Renaissance, about 1577 or so, and you could call this mannerist that period of the Renaissance where, again, I think we've seen this before, figures are elongated. Oh, here are my invisible hands doing their thing again. Mm -hmm. uh, and colors are just a little off from the more pure colors that you see in earlier Renaissance. The symbolism here, of course, is just fulsome. So look at the left and right hand sides of this painting. This is the background for Piero's city of work, Borgo San Sepulcro, the city of the Holy Tomb in Tuscany. 
And some of you may recognize that hilly territory with the bushes and the trees a little bit sparse, but on the left, you see that the trees are in winter. There are no leaves, the ground is almost bare. On the right, on the side of the risen Jesus, you can think right hand of God if you want, it doesn't matter. That painting is divided down the middle and Jesus is bringing in new life for nature. The whole world is about to be renewed and you can tell by the clouds, those thin cirrus clouds of the early morning and the lightness on the horizon line that dawn is coming. I hope these guys in the front wake up because it's gonna be pretty interesting. But that's another piece in this painting that is so, uh, well, it's in our, it's at eye level, right? I mean, you're looking at something that would have sat on an altar. So right in front of us are the guards, so to speak. And so human guarding against the power of God is obviously negligible, right? No, there's no power there at all. Jesus has this heroic torso, which you will not see everywhere, but the musculature so developed. And notice that the guards have similar, that guy in brown, he's got a pretty well developed torso himself, but it's slack. He's relaxed. They're, they're not awake. Um, they're not attending to this amazing thing that's going on right there with them. And I think we don't want to miss that. We've seen it in those Passion Week things with the parade into Brussels and the crucified Jesus at the Barton Creek Mall. Here's the rising Jesus, nature changing, the dawn of a new age, and these guys are sleeping through it. And you sure don't want that to be you, do you? And that would be part of the message of a painting like this. So uh, I think we better just keep moving on. And I'm so sorry, we don't have time for questions. I know you guys are seeing things that I'm not even able to see here, but we'll just have to wait for another chance to join. Uh, the one thing I did, it's pink robe. It's so lovely, isn't it? And you don't have to go back, Matt. We'll just, but um, that pink robe is a very mannerous color and quite different from the bright reds and uh, deep blues that Jesus has been dressed in so often in earlier Renaissance painting. And it makes him so front and center. You, you can't miss that color, but it also softens him a bit. A very austere face. No judgment, but no, ah, oh, here I am, smile every, no. This Jesus is coming back and he, uh, he has, literally seen it all and now comes back with his with his banner about to step out of that tomb with his foot up i it's such an amazing figure and i wish we had more time but let's go on we'll go we'll go to this one which is also pretty uh, pretty renaissance and a little on the late side again my friends, take a look at the torsos, the musculature. Whoa, it is so developed. Again, you can see the background in nature. This is in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. Vanderbroek, uh, who had a more or less successful career, and heaven only knows how he got this commission to paint this opposite the Last Judgment, because it was really a coup, also had painted in a chapel in Santa Maria Maggiore. Some of you may have been at that church in Rome. It's one of the really ancient churches and a fabulous experience. I hope you get there. But this was a triumph for him to get this commission. And here you see Jesus, you see the same banner, you see some nature around, but a very different experience. Jesus isn't even touching the ground here. He's got strong muscles, but he doesn't really need them, does he? I mean, he's in clothes and this bubble of rainbow light that just seems to be pulsing out from a golden center. His hand raised in traditional blessing and that standard in his hand. There's a very ancient poem that became a hymn. Don't know if it's in the Presbyterian hymnal or not, probably is, but it has the word 
Vexilla, V-E-X-I-L-L-A in it. And it was a poem. Now I'm not sure who wrote it, if it was St. Ambrose or even earlier. The, the flag, the, the banner of God. And Jesus is holding that as if it were a Roman standard. But notice how differently this went. I mean, the, it's constant movement, isn't it? Everything's in motion. We talked about those diagonal lines last week, and here they are. Jesus is pretty upright, but even his leg is flying off to the back, and his arms are going out in diagonals to the side. There is a dynamism to this. This is somehow in process. Now, to the observers, right, the guard, one of whom has his really quite useless sword out. Jesus has already been there, done that. But there it is, and they are overwhelmed by this leg. I don't know if it's uh, too irreverent or not, but it reminds me of that moment in, oh, now I'm not going to be able to do it. Matt, help, uh, Harrison Ford, Raiders of the Lost Ark, there, where the ark is opened and everyone stands around hoping to acquire the power that they believe actually is enclosed in the ark. And that power just comes out as light and overwhelms them, actually melts them. Um, this feels a little like that, although the coffin that we see buried in the ground hasn't been opened. Jesus didn't need it to be opened. He comes out anyway. And these people who think that they've controlled this power are overwhelmed. All their weapons useless. Can I ask a question? Please. So this makes me think of Matthew. Only Matthew's gospel has the earthquake and Jesus appearing like lightning and an angel rolls away the stone. Only Matthew has guards who like shake and, and yeah. fall into a trance or a coma or fall asleep. I mean, so there's it's power, there's some violence to it. Is that the more preferred way of depicting the resurrection in a lot of Renaissance art or some of the more, more gentle, more peaceful, more you know, dew drops in the grass in the garden kind of pictures. Yeah, I'm not thinking there are that many dew drops in the grass unless those cirrus clouds had a lot of dew falling in the earlier one. Um, it's not always this violent. As we saw that Piero one is very meditative and very still and uh, very almost um, as if Jesus, it, it's that moment before the world knows, who knows what those guards will do when they wake up, but uh, there is a, a great interest. And then you're Matt, asking that question, especially in late Renaissance, in this high energy, high dynamism kind of stuff. Then later after the Council of Trent, likewise, where the drama, the moment of high drama is purposefully sought in order to keep people who see this art in their church in the story. A, and I mean, that's explicitly part of the Council of Trent artistic yeah. hopes. So this is pre-Trent, but uh, that it's still late enough to be that high drama interest. And you can see this does that wonderful thing of showing us far back on the right, the story that, that kind of led to this. And there again, or excuse me, the story that follows us, the ascension of Jesus where people are kneeling and Jesus is rising up and the light is with him there. So movement in the story and movement in the painting. And yeah, probably Matthew, great favorite. Let's do the next one. We don't wanna run out of time here. And this, as you can see, 1584, 94, this is El Greco who was born in Crete. Some of you I know have been there, Heraklion probably. But you can tell by his name that he worked his way west and actually painted quite a, quite a bit in Spain. This is late enough to be very, it's, it's almost the surreal end of the Renaissance, this mannerism that loses contact. And El Greco, just go look at his paintings anytime, anywhere, and you'll see exactly what I mean. He really takes that, that sense of the human body and again, elongates it, but here again, you see that, that contortion, uh, the, the, um, 
the mannerist and even post mannerist painters will twist and turn the human body, but partly out of a sense of drama, partly because they're excited to be able to paint it in these different ways. Perspective, which was the guiding light of the Renaissance, it's out the window. You don't know where you are really half the time. And here, it's very difficult to discern any nature in the background, right? So we've moved from that, where nature is um, maybe the sympathetic fallacy. Nature is enacting and showing forth the power of the resurrection. Or maybe it's a theological statement. Nature too will be resurrected to the disappearance of nature. And this almost feels like a judgment scene, doesn't it? Because these guards, one of whom has fallen sprawled with his head toward us. So Gre El Greco can show us foreshortening as well. And these odd, almost sickly colors. If El Greco had come from Minnesota, I would say that it looks like he painted this right before a tornado, right? That same yellow green kind of weird color that the sky gets. Not that our computers show us exactly the right colors, which is why you need to go to the Prado to see this. But again, you see Jesus with the flag minus the insignia this time, but still he's got the banner, which luckily is blowing over him so that we don't find our Lord completely unclothed. Uh, the red robe, the regal robe in the back. One odd bit to draw your attention to in this, it looks like a dance, doesn't it? Like they're dancing around, but no, they're writhing. They really are. Jesus has a very oddly shaped halo. It's a, it's a, a rhombus of some sort. And it is more typically Byzantine than the rounded ones that you saw on those Italian paintings. So Jesus is still haloed, but his hand, what's he pointing at? I mean, it's an interest, what's that gesture? Is it the gesture of a rhetor, of a, a speaker? Because there is a gesture that speakers make that looks just like that, used over and over from the classical period. Is he about to say something? I don't, I honestly don't know. His gaze seems to be going in the direction of his hand. And so is he now pointing toward a divine life, toward the power of God, toward something that we can't see? And I'm gonna say either. The, the people who are around Jesus in all manner of degrees of shock and awe are, not looking in the direction he's pointing. So what an interesting thing. Now, what we would do if we were spending more time with this is look and see if it stood as part of a series, a triptych maybe, or a group of paintings that would have been exhibited together in a church uh, or in the hall of a king, depending on for whom this was painted. And I find myself really curious, but I love the thought that maybe, maybe we can't see where Jesus is pointing exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out. Feel free to do so. Every time I look at these paintings, I come up with more papers we could all write, but um, more research than we need to do for Easter Sunday morning. And there is a pointing to that which we cannot yet see. Absolutely. We'll see that more and more as we go on. Matt, let's do the last one kind of quick. I don't want to run out of time totally. So this one comes from a guy named Ian Pollock. He was born in 1950, uh, a Brit from Cheshire or someplace like that. And um, Pollock is somewhere between a, kind of a surrealist in a way, um, as you can see. His, he uses figures as surrealists often do, but then talk about exaggeration. We're way past the Renaissance and mannerism here, right? We don't have to worry about color too much, although notice that shading of yellow, that light that we saw surrounding the, the uh, bowl picture and, and all of them really, as Jesus rises up, is alluded to here. We can't really see it, it's gray behind Jesus no nature at all, not even really a background. We have no clue 
where Jesus is. There's no coffin down there. There's no tomb. There's no altar. However, you read that one that we see Jesus climbing out of in the first painting. There's just this man. There's no halo. But we know it's Jesus because that's who Pilate said he wanted to paint. He does not have musculature like the first two, nor does he have that sort of more emaciated look, still some muscle, but very attenuated that El Greco shows us. He's just kind of an odd body with, I don't know, he looks like somebody who's really, really skinny and wearing a jacket with old shoulder pads, doesn't he? Like the pads stick up, but he's not really there. So clearly, clearly, Ian Pollock, who once described himself somewhere online, it's the only way I know, as um, an, an artistic Tourette syndrome painter, doesn't care if this looks like a real body. And somehow it's all about the head, both for Jesus and for the two creatures that are human-like. But, uh, oh, are they really human who are at his feet? You know, in a way this reminds me of, um, and it's probably reading too much in, but I'm gonna do it anyway. St. Michael standing on the dragon that he slays in, in his final battle, or St. George standing on a dragon, different saints, different countries, doesn't really matter, or Mary trampling the snake because she's a symbol of new life and the end of all that caused the fall. And it's as if one of Jesus's feet each is on these sort of slithery, low-lying creatures who stare up at him with something akin to clown makeup and Pinocchio noses. I, we, again, could spend a really long time on this. I think I want to just say Jesus doesn't look happy here either. Jesus doesn't rise from the dead and wipe his brow. And, oh, well, I got through that. Now it's all flowers and bunnies and eggs. No, I mean, this, this coming back, this re-engaging humanity is serious business for Jesus. Even though we talk about joy, and I think rightly, there's, I don't know, if I were Jesus, I would be too minded about coming back in human form. Matt, you look like you're gonna tell me to move on. Oh, well, sure. But there's, we don't often talk about lingering trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Easter, but but he does come back with the wounds of crucifixion, according to two of the Gospels. And, you know, there's something about that that's maybe worth talking about. But we do have to move on, don't we? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Our second movement, you said we're going to look at, at witnesses to the tomb. And this jumps us to the Gospel of John, where we have the only time we learn about a foot race. Yeah, Isn't, that's a wonderful piece. Two disciples. Uh, great, foot race because I don't quite trust the women's testimony. Well, they were the, they were there first in all four for sure. So um, we, we're not going to linger on this again. That's up to you, and you can do it uh, and come back and take another look or look at it online and find out a whole lot more about it. You can tell maybe that this is an an attempt to take seriously what the world of Jesus might have looked like, as well as Bernand is able to tell you he comes from the very end of the 19th century and there was a, a lot of interest in portraying the Holy Land as it may have looked. It having become more accessible to people, um, including artists of various sorts. Check out James Tissot, T-I-S-S-O-T, -S -S for the same kind of interest. Again, we have that dawn uh, sky, I think here maybe as beautifully done as I've seen it. And these two really serious, really eager, really uncertain. I mean, we could look at their expressions and try to guess. I know how fruitless that can be. It's hard to read another person's face, but I'm saying those wide open eyes of Peter, like, just uh, let me see. And there's a kind of a yearning anguish in that face 
and the folded hands of the beloved disciple. One old, one young, and we know Peter and John get there, or the beloved disciple, I should say, and become witnesses to the resurrection. This is, I think, before they actually looked in the empty tomb. Though I could be wrong, they could be staring into it even as we speak. Beautiful faces, aren't they? I, they're just beautiful faces. But let's let's go on and let's, Matt, you have something to add because these faces are a little different. And we do have a little nature, but this is Romare Bearden. Some of you have heard of him. He was born in the 20th century, 1911, barely in the 20th century, died at the end uh, around 88 and moved through an array of artistic media. He was born in North Carolina, but raised in New York and came from a really interesting family where um, leading painters and writers and musicians from the Harlem Renaissance. And you can look that up if you are more interested in it. Some of you know more about it than I do. Met at the house of his parents and himself. So he's well-educated and becomes this painter Harking back to what people first thought was going to be sort of a regionalist style, looking back to the South, because where else would you see a bunch of African-American women congregating like this? His early paintings were often of African-Americans in community, showing some kind of interconnection. And this one called Three Women but also usually understood to refer to three of the women and the numbers of women that gathered after Jesus' death to go to the tomb are a little hard to actually count in a consistent way, but we know usually at least three are mentioned. It's understood that that's who these are. The fact that when you look down in the far lower right corner, excuse me, you see both the bush which is kind of natural in a way, but also always also symbolic. And what looks like it could be a dove insofar as any of these things look exactly like what we normally take them to be, suggests that there's a presence of the Holy Spirit here. So I think Bearden really does want us to see these three women as the three who got up early in the morning and went to the tomb. I forbear even trying to guess if those are cirrus clouds in the background, but they are certainly lovely and they look more like birds anyway. Not leaving shadows on the ground. This is, is an interesting painting, isn't it? I mean, it's so flat. It's that two dimensional sense. Uh, Bearden becomes a collage master and is very, very famous for it. Some of this may actually be collage where he's painted, cut out, and then glued on to, to form an irregular puzzle-like uh, format. And you can see, particularly, I think, in the neck of the woman to the right. But what's interesting to me is just these, the, the African-American face and hands are dark enough to stand out against the brighter robes and that very light one in the center. And, how they are connecting with each other by look, the gaze, by embrace, by gesture. That woman on the right has a gesture not totally different from the one that Jesus showed us in the El Greco painting, as if she's going to say, come on, sisters, we got to get moving. Mm -hmm. Oh, should we go now? I. I mean, you can imagine the conversation and it's, there's an intimacy to it. It's absolutely right at home here. And it's one of those moments where you can see someone understanding that the experience and the witness happen in their own time and community. And I, so we could have put it in the fourth section, but it really is about depicting those female witnesses to the resurrection. We could spend an incredible amount of time thinking about the role of African-American women in their communities and in not least the worshiping communities that gathered around scripture and song for so, so, so many years and still do. 
I hasten to say. But uh, we're going to have to leave that this morning as well. But uh, Matt, anything to throw in there? Just you really brought out that this is an inflection point. There's a decision being made here. There's a, something's being reckoned. It's, you know, yeah. from the way their postures and their faces. I love that. It's almost as if I, I could imagine. Did you remember to bring the myrrh? Oh my, oh, I'll go back and get that. You go on ahead. You know, it, it's so real. It really, it really is. And it, and it took courage. Mm -hmm. We don't always pay attention to that, but it took courage to go there. Even though the women were seemingly ignored at the time of the crucifixion, that Jesus was crucified as, as sort of a traitor to the Roman government, a subversive, it meant that people who hung too close to him could also be in trouble as well. Okay. We 15 minutes to go and here's Ferdinand Boll. Okay, let's go quick with Ferdinand. Ferdinand Boll, who uh, painted in 1638, uh, or drew, I should say, he didn't paint this. Uh, it will go fast, but I pulled this up because it is so interesting to me, uh, the way this is laid out. Now, you remember, we saw how the, the uh, um, oh, Ascension, was on the right-hand side of that other painting earlier of Jesus' resurrection. And we looked off in the right-hand side and there was, here we've got that same thing where different stories are incorporated in the same two-dimensional space. We've got the same, right? So Golgotha is sitting back there on the left. We see some people coming away from the three crosses on the hill. And notice there that T-shaped cross too. There's always concern about what Jesus cross really looked like. I don't think we care about that today. I don't anyway. Back in the background, we've got the city because you remember Golgotha is outside the city walls. We can make out something that looks kind of like a city wall toward that center part there, but it almost looks like skyscrapers in the, the background. I, I had to look twice at Ball State. What? What? We've got nature here. We got lots of bushes and trees growing, but he's not showing us any contrast. So I think it's just a naturalist background because the the of course most important thing here is Jesus and Mary Magdalene and Jesus wearing the gardener's hat, so that it's natural, so to speak. That Mary Magdalene, who notice is not looking up at Jesus, nor should she be, right? I mean, it's male, she's got a modesty to protect, it, it, is thinking that Jesus is the gardener. And if Jesus is the gardener, he has all the power here. Looks like he's even carrying a trowel over there in whatever hand that, would that be his left hand? I'm so terrible at hands. Well, anyway, in the arm hanging down. He's holding what looks like a trowel. Mary has her little container there for spices right in front of her that she's bringing to anoint. But where is Jesus? Again, we have this interesting phenomenon among even those who long to see, who have some kind of hope, who have love for Jesus, of the, the, the difficulty of seeing him. And partly, how do you imagine somebody alive whom you loved. I, I think this is just finally the, the, the most profound comment always. Here it is, how, here's the story, here's the, an, an attempt to get at the experience, you just don't see it. I, I find that this both encourages and terrifies me, frankly, because what I miss, I, I obviously, miss. I don't know. I'm like those sleeping guys, or maybe some days I'm more like those writhing guys, or maybe here I'm in a more pious mode of love. And I still, I need help. It will be Jesus' voice that calls her into remembrance. So Matt, maybe we should move on. Yeah, oh, it's a beautiful scene there in John 20, where he, where she recognizes yeah. only after he calls her by name. Yeah. Which I guess takes us well to this one. It does indeed. This again, um, I would I would say it's a little more classic with a small C. Uh, you can see it's before the, the first half of the 16th century. And again, we have these long figures, but just worth a look 
because of the brilliant color and her, it's her back arm that's kind of shadowed, but we see the light, all, light is always an interesting question in these paintings, where does it come from? And we see light outside, but they're in a very dark shadowed kind of place. And Mary Magdalene is gorgeous. And look at her, she's looking right at Jesus. And he's not wearing a hat. I mean, I think she heard him here. I think she somehow stood up. And again, if you look at those diagonals of their legs, not only do they sort of come together in the middle while the arms push them apart, this would be a perfect painting to put on a Greek base because it kind of flares out toward the top and comes narrower in the bottom. But there's, um, there's the arms again are so interesting. She's, she's ready to hug him. And he says, touch me not. Nolo me tangere. It's, it's a classic description for this scene. He's leaning away as she leans in. So even, the, even seeing her Lord now and having heard her name called by him doesn't mean that it's, um, for lack of a better phrase, business as usual. There's not yet. There's a not yet in this picture that is really powerful. And, I, and I'm not entirely sure what it means. I mean, Thomas gets to poke his finger in Jesus' side. We can't even see Jesus' side here. So friends, there are so many ways we could go. The, the colors in Jesus' robe are so much less vivid than what Mary is wearing, aren't they? I mean, it's as if the green got washed out and the pink got washed out a little bit. Notice they're both wearing red and green, but his, it's as if he's pulled into another dimension. Maybe there's a veil over him in a way. His face is paler, even than hers or grayer. Maybe that's a better word. Hers is pale, but there's a vividness to it. So no. just, oh my gosh. Not yet. It, it's sort of heartbreaking in a way, isn't it? It but, is. It reminds me too, that scene in John chapter 20, he then tells her, go and tell everybody else. But he doesn't say, go and tell them I've risen from the dead. He says, go and tell them I'm ascending to my God and my father. He, yes, it's yeah. His, I, I'm not, the work's not done yet. You know, that it's interesting that the Easter is not the, the last act. No, and when you say it like that, Matt, I mean, go that I'm ascending. So that ascension becomes really right. as important and, and necessary, maybe for Pentecost, which we usually think of as Act Three. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have fewer than 10 minutes. So oh, okay, let's go. go. I'm sorry. Takes, All right. Contemporary I'm, takes in the meaning. Yeah. Oh, this, this is a great painting, a little hard to see. Some of you may have seen it in person. Somewhere in, uh, I think it's might be at the Tate, but I'm not sure. It could be at the British Museum. Stanley Spencer painted this after World War One, and uh, he also lived through World War Two. There, he has another painting called "The Resurrection of the Soldiers," which you can look up. But uh, he doesn't paint figures in. in he's not concerned with all the muscles in the torso, although that guy dead center. Well, there are two guys kind of dead center, do have muscles and you know, you can see the hamstring and the quads, and, but it's, it's because he wants to say this is real, that, that there's realia here. These are, this is an English graveyard. It's just a bunch of old graves. If you ever walk in England, you'll see these uh, sarcophagus style, coffin style, um, larger memorials and the lids come off and people come out and they're not coming out. You've seen paintings of Lazarus where he comes out all white and wrapped up like a mummy because that's sort of what the Johannine gospel suggests would have been the case. He smells or no, no, these people are, this is new life. It's not old life somehow partially back. It's, new life 
And these are the believers in the churchyard waiting all these years. It's, it's a fabulous piece. Yeah. It's what we all long for. And if you look back on the left, my friends, and do, we're going to move on in a second. You see that there are lots of people who have been raised from the dead. This is a big deal. This is as big as trees in flower over against no trees at all. And of course, you see lots of flowers to go with. Okay, Matt, we better keep going. Ah, more flowers. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like Easter, right? And um, th there are a couple paintings that do some really good work with this. I was just mentioning one to Matt earlier this morning. The resurrection is for us, at least. There is a rabbit on this painting in the front. I don't know if you noticed it. About... Wherever you live, a big city, some little houses, some condos, it, does, it doesn't matter. There's gorgeous color. The resurrection is about the bread and the wine and then the new life and these beautiful flowers that could almost look like fireworks. This is our friend, uh, the Episcopalian, Jan Connect, and uh, he is always, he, he some of you have read Richard Scary books to your children and grandchildren. He always has a busy world, just like Richard Scary. But again, I want you to notice the light is just phenomenal. Nature is front and center in these flowers, even though we're not getting, you know, a lot of trees and a lot of this. This is about greening and growth. And I think when we hear those words in 2021, we think about the call to love our planet as well as ourselves and the bread and the wine it turns out are not only for us and there's a guy in there in this picture who looks like he's surfing i mean he's in it, what looks like water it could be baptismal his hands are up and we can't quite see why from here i wish we were closer in but we're going to see something similar in just a minute go ahead matt that's not a reference to Jonah? I, I don't know. It could be. It looks like the whale to me. Uh, being spit out. A fish to me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Away from the fish. Very good. Thank you. Uh, this is a lovely painting by an English woman, Dinah Rowe Kendall. You can read all about her online if you want in Wikipedia. We have that same kind of um, a, a, a sort of a flat quality and the word for the way the table looks here is the picture plane is lifted up. We don't have perspective. What we have is an artist who wants to show us what's on the table and so she does it. Never mind the laws of physics. So we get to see the bread that's held here and we see the wine. We see plates and glasses, although are they in the right number? Who knows? We see the two who walk the Emmaus Road inviting Jesus to stay, except, wait a minute, that looks like a marble windowsill. We see nature in the background. It's leafy and beautiful. And again, the colors are quite lovely, complex patterns, polka dot curtains, checkerboard, tablecloths, blue chairs. What I'm interested in in this, among other things, is both the contemporary costuming and the sort of lack of clarity about the gender of the participants. It's not really very clear in the Emmaus Road story in Luke, who is there with Cleopas. And I always have pretended for myself that it was his female companion named Susanna. I just made that name up, but I really like it and it made sense to me. There were women we know in Luke's story, and this is a Luke story, who did follow Jesus and were with him over and over. And you can look back in Luke 8 for that. But for us, it, it's these are not necessarily men. In fact, when I first looked at this, I thought this was three women around a kitchen table. Kathleen Norris has a wonderful poem about that. Ah, oh, well, names just not going to come that fast, but you could probably find it. And Women sit around kitchen tables, they did. Men sit around tables out in the square, women sit in the kitchen. And yet it does look like Jesus. It's got the robe. It's, 
they've got the gestures. Have they recognized him yet? The bread isn't broken. So I'm thinking, no, they're talking to this guy they met on the road. He's telling them stories. They're saying, what, who are you? He's saying, who are you thick headed today? In a minute, he's gonna break the bread and they'll know who he is and they'll be gone. All right, Matt, we better hurry. That's get- fun, just about a minute, minute and a half. Ah, perfect place to end because this is that water again. And, it, and that was Joan, of course it was. I just didn't put the two together as well as I should have, Matt. So uh, this is obviously the baptism of Christ, but it's so explosive color-wise with that same gold that I've, I, and we talk about that crucifixion being the baptism with which Christ was also baptized and that rising from the water in new life that I felt bold to include this and I couldn't put my dolphin one in more on that some other time but you can see there's almost a night sky and night water and it is being exploded by this column of light that looks like the second painting we saw this morning if a bit more impressionistic in style nice thick blouse primary colors again we've got a real body and jesus head bent down a lot of people think there wasn't that back piece of the cross and that's why jesus head hung down like that and of course you can't see me i'm acting this out but the arms up the head down the baptism of his death into new life and then maybe we understand a little bit for ourselves how emerging from the water into that new light now not to be taken away although often dim in our experience is available to us and of course the holy spirit present there in a in a lovely way more clearly than romare bearden's bird okay happy easter <laughs> sarah, sarah thank you so much i hope it's a great easter for you thanks for sharing uh, your your insights your knowledge with all of us at Westminster. Oh man, it's never something I don't want to do. So call me anytime. All right, we'll call you again for sure. All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you and have a wonderful Easter.